Welcome back, everybody. Welcome to BTM to the Basketball Time Machine, the podcast with former NBA players about former NBA players. If you want to hear more podcasts like this one, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you always get notified once we upload a new podcast. So let's get going with today's show. Today's guest played in the NBA from 1985 until 1988 for the New York Knicks. Chris McNeely, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for having me. So you were drafted in 1983 by the Kansas City Kings. Do you remember the day of the draft, how it felt? Well, the day of the draft was, uh, like like for most players, a, a very nervous day. Uh, sitting there, I didn't go to New York. I was there uh, in, in Fresno, California, where I'm from with my family, waiting for my name to be called. And uh, once it was called, I was I was all excited and ready to go. But, uh, you know, things changed and things happened quickly during that, that, that day and which actually made a difference in my, in my career. But still, I've been blessed uh, either way. So the 1983 draft class was a pretty good one. You had players like Ralph Sampson, Byron Scott, Dale Ellis, Jeff Malone, Clyde Drexler, just to name a few. Were you surprised by any of the picks? Uh, no, I was not surprised by the picks at all. There was a lot of great players coming out that year. And um, unfortunately, it affected me in my draft class with, with my position. I was a I was a second round pick. I was the first player chosen for the for the Kansas City Kings at the time, um, which which made me a, a really a first round pick because I was their first player chosen. They didn't have a first uh, round pick. But what happened was I was traded. I was traded after that. I was traded to the Chicago Bulls, um, and uh, the Chicago Bulls had three first-round picks. So that made me the fourth player chosen in the draft, which was very difficult at the time. And um, in the end, I, I wound up uh, selecting to play in in Europe for that first year. So that that changed things for me. In 1986, you were signed by the New York Knicks. But even though the Knicks had a great coach, a Hall of Fame coach now in uh, Yubi Brown, the team struggled. What do you remember of that season? Well, I remember uh, at the time the basketball was, uh, you know, ran through. We had a high profile player. We had Patrick Ewing. And, um, you know, the, the team was trying to run everything through Patrick, which was causing problems for other players. Nothing to take away from Patrick. He's a great player, a Hall of Fame player. But the other players on the team were, were standing back, kind of, you know, just sitting back watching the show in, in a sense. And uh, we kind of got caught up into the point of not being able to do all that we could do as players um, because the focus was on one player. Unfortunately, um, the team did struggle and, uh, you know, we, we were playing also in a, at an era where there were some other great teams around. You know, the Boston Celtics was a great team and um, we were in the East. And it was difficult for us. You just mentioned the rookie Patrick Ewing, but you also had a pretty good rookie season. You started in six games and you grabbed almost seven rebounds in only 20 minutes. Um, how satisfied were you with your rookie season? Uh, after the fact, um, you know, I was really disappointed with my season. I was disappointed with my career in the sense that, you know, um, I was going into to a situation where after not being drafted by that club, having the struggle of, of, of being traded, you know, you kind of lose your, 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 your confidence in your game. And once I did get selected to play with the Knicks, it was just like, you know, I was trying to find myself. The following season, the Knicks struggle again, even though you had some great players, some some great and young players like, um, yeah, you mentioned Patrick Ewing already, but Kenny Skywalker, you had um, Jared Wilkins, Dominic Wilkins, his younger brother. What do you think was the, the main problem of the team? Why didn't it work out the way everybody was expecting it? Well, it, it wasn't that. Pro Patrick was not the problem being the main focus. Patrick was just such a dominant player that he had no choice. You know, you, you wanted to run everything through him. Um, you know, back then, being in New York was you were really on the big stage. Uh, there were there were pressures to win, as they are now for New York. And uh, we just couldn't overcome those pressures plus The, the league, the, the the Eastern Conference was very strong. You know, like I said, we had the Celtics, we had the Pistons, uh, and then uh, and then came uh, Michael Jordan. You know, with the, with the Bulls, so it was very difficult um, to to 
to get out of the East or to, to just, you know, make that playoff run. So we just, it was it's difficult times. All right. You played with the one and only Bernard King. Yes. True NBA legend. How was that? Oh, was, was like I said, was one of the uh, hardest working players, most dedicated players that I had ever seen. Uh, this guy had a, a, a routine, a pregame routine that he was in another world. You know, he's in another world. He came out during the warmups, just like a bull being let out in a Spanish arena <laughs> before the fight. And it was and from there on, it was he was just in his world and he and and uh, nobody could stop him. Just just dedicated to the game. Great guy. Why do you think he's still underrated? I mean, many of the younger generations haven't even heard of this guy, but even in the in the 90s, it seemed that this guy got overlooked. Why is that, you think? Uh, you know, he uh, if I can recall his career, he was in Golden State. Um, then he moved on to the Nets. He was one the team wasn't winning okay and and people look at winners uh the, the championships and stuff and that's not you you can't you can't um you know you can't give a, a player the the respect or the non-respect just because they won a championship or not or they were on the winning team or not because they're the nba is for the you know the best players in the world a play there and there's so many guys but it depends on the market that you're in or the team the 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 um the success of the team it can determine your <laughs> uh your position of notoriety and stuff like that and i think he's just caught up in that but one of the best players to ever play the game and still today like you said he, he doesn't get the recognition of of all that he did for the game absolutely you play it The power four position, if I remember correctly. Yes. But you're only six foot seven. How difficult was it being an undersized power forward in the 80s? Yeah, very, very difficult. And like I said, you know, my my thing was I was an athletic in college. I was an athletic player, you know, uh, playing small four. I, I was versatile, so I could play very many different positions and stuff. And I just took on the role that that was available to me. So uh, it was very difficult because you had players like Rick Mahorn. Who would be a six nine two eighty, and here I was six seven two thirty five on a good day. Um, but my advantage was I had long arms and I and I was and I was versatile, so I could I could defend, uh, I could I could um, you know uh, get around players somewhat. Not, not I don't say Dennis Rodman style, but you know being more active. To, to be able to do things that uh, was very difficult. But on the on the other end, it was a physical it was a physical challenge for me. I can imagine. So who was the toughest guy you had to guard? <laughs> yeah, that list, that, do you mean the list of the toughest yes. guy? Because, you know, back then uh, there was Larry Bird. I, I defended Larry Bird. I defended uh, Mikhail. Um, I, I would have to try to defend um, McAdoo. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Every night in the NBA, there there is a challenge booth. So if you want to say the toughest, the toughest, Larry Bird. I would say Larry Bird because yeah. there was there was really no no stopping him at that time. Did he trash talk to you? No, no, he did not. Um, you know, he's a very was very professional and stuff. Um, you know, I wasn't one of the the. Uh, Uh, focal points of the team, but still, when you're out there on the floor competing, you're, you're competing one on one with the with the with your uh, your your opponent and stuff like this. And it wasn't trash talking. I gave respect. He he gave respect. Uh, but you did have some player players that would trash talk. Uh, and but it was just all part of the game, all the fun part of the game. <laughs> all right. So um, you already mentioned that the '80s had some of the greatest teams ever. Uh, we're talking about the 76ers, um, the Lakers, the Celtics, Detroit Pistons, um, and the Milwaukee Bucks apparently all, always get overlooked. But who do you think was yeah. the toughest team you ever had to play against? The toughest team would be, uh, when you when you say team, you know, it, it's an overall team. Of course, there was there were Chicago Bulls with Michael Jordan, but that was one player. Um so, yes, uh, apart from Chicago, that was, you know, basically Jordan. When you talk about a team, the Celtics and uh, the Pistons 
were two teams, complete teams, because they had it all. The Celtics had just the team chemistry, the 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 the, the history behind them that they you know they wanted to win. They knew how to win. The Pistons were physical at the time and had the skill sets and stuff like this. Uh, so they had two teams. It was a complete team. There was no way that you know one player or another team could get around it because they can cover every position. They can defend, they can score, and they just wanted to win. They knew how to win. So you, so you had three NBA seasons with the New York Knicks. How was it playing in the Madison Square Garden? The Madison Square Garden was probably, uh, at the time, the best place to play uh, in the NBA because the atmosphere was coming from the fans. The fans going into the arena Those fans, kids, you could you you could run into a kid that would be 18 years old and he could break down the game to you. He knew the game or as they got older, because these kids, the, the, the parents were taking their their kids for years and years to watch the Knicks because that was the show. Uh, even as as, uh, you know, most foreigners, Europeans going to the United States, going to New York, one of the places to visit was the Madison Square Garden. You know, the, the so so the, the fans and the, the atmosphere of playing at the at, at the garden was just uh, next to none. So you retired many years ago and you're now living in Europe. How do you keep yourself busy? I heard you have a bed and breakfast in Italy. Is that right? Yes. Uh, my wife and I, we have a bed and breakfast. It's called Il Bosco di Cervi, which means in Italian is the forest of the deer because uh, we're here in the hills between Bologna and Florence and there's a lot of forest around us. Just full of deers, <laughs> so we called it the for the house, the forest of the deer. The house was actually built by a painter, but we wanted to give it our own personal touch, so we called it the forest of the deer. Um, two more things before I let you go. Do you have a funny story from your NBA days? My NBA days. <laughs> uh, <laughs> funny story from my NBA days. I, uh, well, the, the, yeah, the story, but it's not about me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm listening. <laughs> you know, I that when I speaking back about the, the the playing for the Knicks and the Madison Square Garden, and I was talking about the fans and how the fans are, you know, they 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 were on you and they 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 expected from you. So no matter who you were, and I remember <laughs> we had Patrick Ewing night. Not picking on Patrick because that's my best friend, one of my best friends. Uh, we had the Patrick Ewing night. And so they handed out posters of Patrick Ewing to all the fans and everything like this. And Patrick was having a terrible game that game. So now you had the fans who were just booing and stuff. And I recall one kid took the poster and stuck his head through the picture of where Patrick was and had his head in there. And he jumped out and ran <laughs> around the court. <laughs> <laughs> so my last question, that's actually my favorite part of the show. I want you to name your top five ever plus a sixth man, but you have to go with one point guard, one shooting guard, one small forward, one power forward, one center. And The sixth player can be whatever um, position, but we're talking all time. Wow, all time, all time. Oh, okay. Michael Jordan. Uh, I'll put him at shooting guard. Um, Magic Johnson has to be my point guard. I'm gonna go with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Okay, as, like as your a, team so far. As a, as a center, Oscar Roberts. Yeah, Oscar Robertson. I'll put him at power forward. And what am I missing? I'm missing small forward. Small what, forward. What about Larry? Uh, there, there you go. I got, I got to throw him in there as a, as a small forward. Larry Bird. Six man goes to LeBron James. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Yes. Can't say nothing against that. Wonderful. So, Chris, it was wonderful having you on the show. Okay. Hey, Sean, it's been a pleasure. Um, whatever you need, I'm here and, and uh, keep doing what you're doing because it's something that's really, really needed for, for, for the younger generations to know about uh, the past and continue on with the future.